Bahati Roofers, and welcome to Roofer Growth Hacks, the podcast that's dedicated to highlighting those in the roofing industry, learning how they overcame growth challenges and creative growth hacks, connecting them with others in the roofing industry. I'm your host, Chris Hunter, founder and chief marketing officer of RoofingSites.com. I'm also the author of The Ultimate Guide to Digital Marketing for Roofers. Got a little story for you. Moshe Cohen with Negotiating Table Inc. provides training, dispute resolution, coaching related to negotiations, leadership, conflict management, and communication. In this episode, Moshe shares some great advice on how to manage conflict and negotiations in your roofing company. So be sure to listen up as Moshe shares some awesome growth hacks. Well, howdy roofers and welcome back to another podcast uh, for Roofer Growth Hacks. Uh, We've got Moshe Cohen on here. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of your wisdom here with our roofing family. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Awesome. Well, Moshe, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your your journey? You know, where did you start? Where are you now? What are you doing? How are you helping people? So my journey is a little strange because I started off in science. I started off in physics. And then I was an engineer for about 13 years. I decided that I was more interested in the people side of things than the robots and, and computer stuff that I was doing at the time. So uh, I decided to go into management. And to that end, I went to business school. In business school, I discovered that I actually didn't like managing anything, but I loved my negotiation class. And as a result of that, I ended up getting some additional training and became a mediator. So this was back in 1995. Soon after that, I started teaching classes in negotiation in addition to mediating disputes between people in conflict. And then in 2000, uh, Boston University um, invited me to teach. So since then, I do a lot of corporate training in negotiation, leadership, conflict resolution, communication, all the people aspects of business. I also teach the same subject in the business school at Boston University. I still mediate all sorts of different disputes, mostly in the business world. And uh, I do a lot of consulting, coaching, and uh, public speaking and writing. And uh, I've written three books. One of them is a negotiation book, and uh, the other two are collections of essays about optimism and that kind of thing. I wrote them during the pandemic. It was kind of depressing. So I wrote these essays to cheer myself up and people liked them. So I published them. Wow. That's awesome. That's pretty cool. I'd like to get a copy of one of those. Yeah, for sure. Tell us a little bit about your company and, and really who's your, your target audience? Who do you help best? So I, I work really in two main areas. One is Everybody, and especially everybody in the business world, negotiates all the time. You negotiate to get clients. You negotiate to resolve issues that come up with clients. Um, You negotiate to resolve money matters at the end of jobs because that's often where they show up. So I work with people in all aspects of that. So I work with people who are selling. And if you run your own business, you are by definition selling. And then throughout the project, project managers have to deal with an awful lot of negotiations. And uh, again, if you run your own business and you're working with clients, you are managing projects. And then finally, there's all the financial and and terms related issues that come up on projects. So I help people with those. When things go bad, the other side of my business is that I I help people resolve conflict by actually getting in the middle as a mediator and helping people work things out without telling them what to do. So I facilitate their conversation and help them come to resolution. What's like the typical scenario for that so it really is all over the map but very often something has gone wrong yeah and it could be that the owner for example is expressing some disappointment or unhappiness with the way a job was done and the the roofer for example might be you know might be feeling like they did exactly what they said they were going to do Mm -hmm. and that the problem is that the owner had expectations that were somehow not realistic or or not based on what was contracted. Usually they try to talk it out themselves. And when that works out, that's great. But sometimes it doesn't. And very often the conflict can escalate from there. People usually stop communicating and then they might send a lawyer letter to each other. And at this point, things are kind of bad. Now, they could go the litigation route and a lot of people do that. But litigation takes a long time and it's very expensive and it's very damaging to relationships and reputations. So if people decide to try to work things out on their own, they can go and find a mediator. Sometimes their lawyers help them find mediators. Sometimes they do it on their own. And really the mediator facilitates a discussion between them. And 
you know, both parties talk about their perception of the situation, what they want to see happen from there. And the conversation will very often lead to some sort of resolution where nobody comes out of it completely happy, but everybody comes up, comes up out of it happy enough. And that's better for them than pursuing other choices. So something that you said earlier is that everyone is negotiating all the time, right? From project managers yeah. to sales to whatever, right? So what's, let's talk about like sales, right? What's, what's mm -hmm. the typical, what do you coach on, you know, helping people negotiate through, through sales? So I have three pieces of advice that I give over and over again. Okay. Um, the first one is know your stuff, come in prepared, okay. right? You're going to get questions. You're going to have to present yourself as knowledgeable mm -hmm. and you really don't want to fake that. So if there are different choices to be made, right? Different materials, the roofing, mm -hmm. for example, or different, uh, ways of constructing the roof or that that kind of thing you want to be as knowledgeable as you can um, about your craft yeah. secondly you need to know things about the environment what are the material costs these days and how do they impact the project what are logistics and how long is it going to get materials and that kind of thing because all of that stuff is going to come into the conversation and preparation is so important when you're negotiating if you're unprepared bad things happen. The yeah. second thing is, I, I don't know if you've heard the saying that we have two ears and one mouth and we should use them in proportion. Yes. The best negotiators are the best listeners. Spend twice as much time asking questions and listening as you do talking about yourself and your business and your roofs and all that stuff. Because frankly, nobody cares, right? Customers don't care about you and your business and, and what, you know, what you know how to do. Customers care about their own problems. So you want the customer to talk as much as possible. You know, sometimes people call me up and they say, hi, Moshe, we've heard of you. We'd like you to, we'd like to do a negotiation workshop. What can you do for us? And instead of telling them what I can do for them, I say to them, that's wonderful that you want to do a negotiation workshop. Why? Why do you want to do one? What is difficult that you want to make easier? What is, you know, challenging that you want to make less challenging, what's not efficient that you want to make more efficient. Let's pretend we do a negotiation workshop and it's fabulous. What's different for you? What do you imagine things looking like at the end? I get them to talk about themselves for the next half hour. Yeah. And at the end of that, I can go, well, based on what you've told me, which is that your need are this, 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 and that, here's what I would suggest we do. And they go, wow, you really understand us. And then they buy. So that's the same thing with the roofer. I mean, people want to know that you're listening to them, that you understand what their issue is. You know, it, are you talking to someone who has a huge sense of urgency because they're actually seeing some water damage? Are you talking to someone who really cares about aesthetics and that's their main concern? They want to have the prettiest house in, in the neighborhood. Depending on what they're saying to you, you need to hear that from them so you know what words to use to make the sale. Very often we try to make the sale based on pitching something that we think is great, but until we know what they're going to think is great, we don't know which aspect of what we do to actually emphasize. And the third thing is uh, probably the two words I say the most in my coach negotiations are slow down. Oh, yeah. See, because what happens is you're talking to a customer and then they ask you a question and you get excited because that's right up your alley. And in your excitement, you start babbling. Yeah. And now you're just babbling and you're no longer focused on actually selling and actually, uh, you know, addressing their concerns. Or they ask you something that challenges you. They bring up a competitor who is priced at 40% lower and now you're anxious. And the problem is that whenever our emotions get engaged in a negotiation, be it, you know, excitement, anger, frustration, anxiety, wh whatever it is, our ability to use our skills including our listening and selling skills goes way down. Yeah. So one of the things that you need to do is to learn how to slow yourself down, take a breath, stay silent for a bit and just make, see our, our brains consist of different parts. There's, there's a part of our brain that really processes emotion. And then there's another part that processes thought. And the part that processes emotion is faster, generally because we're humans, the thinking part wins out eventually, but yeah. it's slower. So we need time for our thinking brain to catch up to our emotional brain. So if we slow things down, we can respond to situations rather than just react to them in the moment. And, and that was going to be the other question that I asked, you know, because you, you said earlier on, on bringing up emotions and letting the emotions get the most of you there, but it sounds like you've already answered that of just slowing down, right? Are there any other tools or techniques that you have 
to give to someone that's that's in that fight or flight mode, right? Because it happens to everybody, every business owner, every salesperson, every operations, anyone who's dealing with other people get that periodically, right? Oh, what God, every tech- parent, every human, yeah. we all get that, sure. right? <laughs> right. I think I had that with my son last night, you know, 19 year old. So <laughs> yeah. So h- how do you, you know, wh- what's, what, what are your techniques? What are, what are your, you know, strategies for removing yourself from that, you know, emotionally from that, that situation and, and let that happen? So that's a great question because telling people to slow down is, you know, valuable. Yeah. Yeah. But how do you actually do that? Right. So there's a few things that uh, I suggest to people. One is if you're in a position where you feel yourself emotionally agitated, and again, it could be excited, it could be a good emotion. One thing you can do is to just say nothing. If you're not saying anything at all, you're also not saying anything you're going to regret. I can think of many times when I spoke in haste and regretted it. Mm-hmm. I can think of no times when I took a beat and regretted just taking a beat. Yeah. So when in doubt, just zip it. I mean, a few years ago, I had one of the easiest sales calls of my life. This guy I worked with at one company, left his company, went to a new company, called me up and said that his boss, the VP of sales, wanted to do a negotiation training. And, uh, and he set up the call between me and his boss. Now, in my world, it doesn't get easier than that. You know, I've, they know they have a need. I have a warm internal contact that's already set up the call with the decision maker. All I need to do is get on the call and not blow it. Yeah. So let me tell you how I blew it. I, I get on the call with the VP of sales and I instantly didn't like the guy. I found him arrogant. Really? And then he asked me a question I didn't like. He asked me for a discount, but the way he asked made me feel disrespected, like he didn't oh. value what I did. Right. And that moment of feeling disrespected, I said something I probably shouldn't have said, something yeah. along the lines of, I only give discounts to my special customers. And that second, I lost the sale. Wow. Think how much smarter I would have been had I just zipped it for 10 seconds. Because I guarantee you, yeah. anything I would have said 10 seconds later would have been smarter than that. Because that was wow. the bar was pretty low. Yeah. So just say nothing. That's one thing. The second thing is you can call for a break. I'm going to give you the words of the successful negotiator. Ready? Thank you. Let me get back to you. I'm like, you need to learn how to disengage. You will find yourself under so much pressure when you're negotiating that anything you do in that peak emotional point, you're likely to regret. Nice. So if the person says, you know, what would you do in this situation, that situation, that one, how much, how much would that cost? So what you do is you say, okay, so it sounds like you're concerned about this issue and you want to know about these circumstances. Uh, let me take a look at that and get back to you. Now you regain control of yourself and you regain control of the negotiation. Right? My favorite thing to do though, is instead uh-huh. of responding to what the other person said, I acknowledge what they've said. And then I turn around and ask them questions to turn the floor back to them. If they say, well, what would you do about squirrels and bats? You say, oh, it sounds like you have a concern about animals getting into your ha- into your house. Tell me more about where that concern comes from. Now they'll talk for half an hour about all the squirrels and bats that have gotten they got into their old house. Mm-hmm. And while they're talking, you're also calming down. Okay. You're, you're learning some good information, but you're also calming down and uh, learning to kind of acknowledge what they've said. Because if you don't acknowledge it, they're not going to let you ask another question. Yeah. yeah. But then ask the question to turn the floor to them. The, the last thing I, I want to say is that uh, I take notes when I negotiate and, you know, bring a pad with you. I'm very old fashioned. I take notes with a paper pad and a pencil, right? I'm very, <laughs> very old fashioned, right? Yeah. Yeah. I can't write as fast as I talk. Writing things yeah. down slows me down. Writing things down gives me a place to focus. And, uh, you know, the scratchy sound that pencil makes on paper, for some reason, I find it calming. Right. Interesting. Everybody has different triggers that send them into emotional overload. Yeah. yeah. They have different stress symptoms that let them know that mm-hmm. they're being triggered. And uh, they have different techniques that work for them to slow down. But the, mm-hmm. the important part is to be, is to the awareness. Mm-hmm. Right. And in, in, uh, in Kali Wobbles, in my book. So my book is called Kali Wobbles How to Negotiate When Negotiating Makes You Nervous. And, and the word Kali Wobbles actually means tummy ache. It means the, like nervous stomach. In, in chapter two, I talk about this emotional response curve where when you get this, this emotional spike that comes because your amygdala just got, got activated. So it's good for you to know what kind of things tend to send you there. Yeah. It, it's really important for you to know what are some of the symptoms that you encounter when that happens to you. So for some people, for example, your muscles really tense. Other yeah. people feel hot. People's heart rate goes up. Those kinds of things. So you to look out for those symptoms. And when you feel your blood pressure rising, 
that's a sign to you that you need to slow down. So that's when you use the techniques of, you know, staying silent, taking a breath, asking questions and listening, asking for a break and those kind of things. Love that. So let me ask you, right, we've got a lot of new roofing company owners that are listening to this right now. What advice would you give to them if they're just starting out their their roofing company? So I think the first thing I tell people is that people do business with people. And when you have an opportunity to talk to a homeowner, or it could be a business owner, right? I'm sure some people work in residential and some in commercial. It's the person-to-person connection that actually gets you the work, right? People hate it when you're salesy. People hate it when you get kind of slick. They want to feel connected to you. And there are basic things you do there. Right, you, uh, you you have to be authentic. You have to be genuine. I think they want to see that you're really you. That, that you're not just putting on a show for them. They, they want to know that you care. So asking questions, listening to them, asking follow-on questions to understand them better, using empathy to demonstrate that you actually understand them. Yeah. All right. By the way, I hate it when people tell me they understand me. I want them to show me. So if I say to you, yeah, you know, we've gotten squirrels in this house for you know the third time. By the way, that's not a fictitious example. We have gotten squirrels in our house three times. Wow. For you to say, so keeping animals out of your roof is one of your main concerns. Now I know you get it. Yeah. And now I'm much more likely to work with you. Yeah. Uh, finding things that you have in common that greatly increases your likability. But again, you can't fake any of this. You got to create a genuine connection with the other person. Um, demonstrating your competence. And I think people actually judge you more by the questions that you ask than by the statements that you make. You don't have to demonstrate to them that you have a PhD in roofing. Like you can say stuff that will like completely snow them and they won't really understand it and won't really care. But if you're asking questions to really understand their concerns, really, you know, understand more about the project, the house, their family, their business, whatever it is, their schedule, their their uh, budget, all of those things that might Im- impact your ability to sell and might impact the project, your curiosity about them and desire to understand them before you try to sell them anything, that creates that person-to-person connection. And uh, that's gold. You do that, you know, you're most of the way there. Yeah. Love that. Absolutely love that. And I 100% agree with that. I mean, you've, you've got to be able to... Let you, any any job out there is, is person-to-person in there, I guess, unless you're an engineer working on what was it robotics that, that you right. worked on right? you don't have to be nice to the robots at least not yet maybe with ai not at some yet. point we'll have to be right but right now we're exactly. good <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah all right so switching gears a little bit what are some of the common mistakes that you see you know roofing companies make and how can they avoid those i think one of the big mistakes people make and this is true in many industries but i've seen it in roofing mm-hmm. is they fall down when it comes to communicating Right. I mean, let's pretend that I told you I'd be there on the 12th, but now I've had issues intervene. I have another job that ran over. Now it looks like it's going to be the 18th. As a homeowner, you want to know. So if I just don't show up or if I just let you know the day off, I'm going to be angry. Yeah. Right? I'm going to be upset with you. So being able to communicate transparently what you know as soon as you know it to make the other person a partner in solving problems, you know, I think is really important. I think people often don't do that enough. First of all, because I think everybody's really busy. You're yeah. busy trying to finish that old job. So it doesn't occur to you that you have to communicate forward to this person who's going to be impacted. Yeah. And secondly, you know, a lot of us are just better and more focused on doing the work than we are about communicating regarding the work. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's two things. And I always tell people, no matter what business you're in, there's the craft that you're in, and then there's the business of that craft. And those are two really separate things. Oh, yeah. I, and I, you know, I, I teach mediators and I, you know, I help them start mediation businesses. And I say, mm-hmm. there's mediating and then there's the business of mediation. And those are two very different things. And one of the big things when it comes to running your business is communicating with your clients. And I think that's where people often fold, fall down. They don't communicate from the other person's point of view. They don't communicate mm-hmm. clearly think they're being clear, but the other person doesn't hear it the way they say it. And I think you need to go above and beyond when it comes to communicating, especially when there's a conflict, but even before that to try to prevent conflict. Love that. Above and beyond. Yeah. And and that's that's true. And not only just with uh, customers, it's also with your employees, right? There can be miscommunication 
happening with the employees on what you wanted them to do or when you wanted them to show up or whatever. So I, I, I totally see that, you know, as, as being an issue. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you have employees, that's a whole nother set of things that you need to be thinking about. Mm -hmm. You know, people have a hard time getting along with each other. Yeah. Um, so one of your jobs is to facilitate collaboration between people to help them resolve issues when issues come up. And it could be that somebody didn't show up or somebody showed up late or somebody took a vacation day without letting the, the other person know. And like stuff right. like that happens on jobs all the time. And it creates friction, it creates conflict. And one of your roles as someone who's trying to run or manage an organization is to try to stay on top of that, stay connected to people, stay communicating with people, notice things as quickly as you can, create an atmosphere or a culture where conflict can be discussed and resolved rather than uh, avoided and, uh, and suppressed until it blows up into something bigger. Conflict doesn't go away on its own most of the time. Yeah. It, it just kind of simmers until it, it blows up and you want, you want to prevent that. You don't, you don't want to get there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, all right, I'm going to put you on the spot here. What okay. is the craziest that you can talk about anyways? What is the craziest mediation that you've ever had to do? The two crazy kind of categories of stuff I do are family businesses and neighbors. Oh, I got to tell you, neighbors have a long time to build up resentments with each other. It could be something as simple as where somebody put a fence. Yeah. And then, you know, they survey the property and it turns out it's four inches over the property line. And now there's a huge, a huge row. But family businesses, you know, people hold stuff, you know, they hold grudges for 20 years. I've had someone say, my grandfather warned me about you on his deathbed. And they, <laughs> this person said that to her brother. I mean, it's just like what? family wow. businesses. Bad. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mediated a big one last year con con uh, involving five siblings. And these people are all older. And uh, at that point, the next generation was already involved in the dispute. And those things just get really nasty. I can't even imagine that. So that's awesome. All this has been great, Masha. I, I really appreciate all this. We're going to pause here for a few seconds for a message from our sponsor, RoofingSites.com. Since 2018, RoofingSites.com has helped roofers double their sales by getting their marketing right using the 4R Roofing Marketing System. If you're a roofing company owner wanting to grow your business, be sure to go to roofingsites.com and sign up for a roofing marketing strategy session with me. All right. And we're back for our lightning round. All right. So we have one rule here, one, and it's real simple. You have to answer each of these questions in one minute or less. Are you ready, Masha? Oh, I don't know. I'll try. All right. Number one question. What is your favorite personal hack? This could be a book. It could be a podcast. Anything goes here. So I think when you mean personal, it's sort of relating to personal life. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I have four kids, right? And uh, one of the books that actually made the most difference for us is actually a book called How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. So in terms of personal life, the ability to hone your listening and really pay attention when people talk to you, that was, that was probably one of the most impactful ones for us. Love that. Love that. I'll definitely check that out. All right. Next question. What is your favorite business hack this could be a book podcast anything goes we're brew for growth hacks mine I <laughs> so you know i, I wrote collie wobbles because what i noticed is that there's lots of good books out there about negotiation but then people go to use stuff and they can't so collie wobbles is all about all about managing your emotions as you negotiate and since we negotiate all the time and we have emotions all the time if you don't do the two the two things together I don't think you're, you're really going to be as effective as you could be. Nice. Love it. Okay. Next question. Marsha, what is the best advice that you have ever been given and bonus points for you, how you actually applied it? To stay curious mm -hmm. that whatever I think I know um, is just what I know today. And that uh, in order to, for example, grow my business, or even grow my hobbies or everything, I got to realize that whatever I think I know is really limited and to always look out for more. There's a famous quote by Isaac Newton. I don't know how I may, may appear to others, but to me, I'm like a small boy wandering on the shore and occasionally finding a pebble while the vast ocean of knowledge is, lays undiscovered before me. So I, I really like this idea that the world is this amazing place and to stay curious about it. Love that. 
Well, Marcia, how can the Roofer Growth Hacks family get in touch with you and help you and support you moving forward? So I'm on LinkedIn almost every day. Um, I do a negotiation uh, video every two weeks, and I post a lot about negotiation, leadership, you know, sort of business ideas, optimism, mindfulness. Um, I did write two books about optimism. One is called Optimism is a Choice. The other one is called The Optimistic Pessimist. And so if people want to follow me on LinkedIn, um, I, I'm, and they can get in touch with me, they, they can always message me on LinkedIn. It's just Moshe Cohen Negotiation. Look for me. It's very, very easy to find me. And then uh, I like when people buy my book. So if people want to go, go buy Kali Wobbles, um, if they prefer audiobooks to um, written books, it's available on Audible, as well as um, Apple Books and all the other audiobook uh, providers and uh, on Amazon as well. So those are the two things. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Moshe, for coming on. And we really appreciate all of the knowledge that you have given to us in this uh, uh, podcast. Really appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. This was a delightful conversation. It was great to meet you. Well, how about that, Roofers? Was that amazing or what? I know that I have a ton. I had literally wrote down two pages worth of stuff here. There were some valuable hacks that Moshe shared during his interview. And I got to say that the three-step process for negotiation that he has is golden, right? Is number one, be prepared. Number two, listen more than you talk. Number three, slow down, right? I think that's that's brilliant. You know, I mean, I mean most of the times, even from sales standpoint, from operation standpoint to any kind of talk that you're having with anybody for that matter, be prepared. I mean, that's, that just makes sense, right? You got to know what you're going to be talking about. Number two, listen more than you talk. I know that I don't do this personally, so I need to, to really coach myself on, on doing this a lot more. And then slowing down, making sure that you take some time, take a deep breath, and slow down before you make any kind of response. His other ones was how to really control your emotions, right? He, he talked about this four-step process of number one, say nothing, okay? That goes back to that slow down. And this is when, when you know, you're heading into an emotional state, you understand uh, that, that you're about to go into that emotional state, you know, number one, say nothing. Number two, call for a break. Thanks so much. You know, let me get back to you on that one. That's key right there, I think, because if, if you can just take a few minutes, an hour, whatever, in between, you know, something that's going to be emotionally charged and go down even, even a day, you know, would you mind let, let me look into that and let's get back, you know, circle back tomorrow on this. I think that's really, really important, right? And number three, acknowledge and then ask a question going back to, you know, what was just said. Number four, Take notes with a notepad. I love that. Here I am sitting here with my notepad. And it's, I, I agree, you know, sometimes just writing things down so that you can go back to them and ask clarifying questions later is kind of an important piece. All right. Well, that's going to do it for another episode of Rupert Growth Hacks. I hope you enjoyed this episode and that you connect with Moshe on LinkedIn. That's where he primarily is. So be sure to go there and go connect with him. Also, while you're out there, make sure that you connect with me on LinkedIn or Instagram, or Facebook, YouTube. We're out there all over the place. You can listen to other episodes for Roofer Growth Hacks at our website at roofingsites.com. And I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsor, roofingsites.com. Since 2018, roofingsites.com has helped roofers double their sales by getting their marketing right using the 4R roofing marketing system. If you're a roofing company owner wanting to grow your business, be sure to go to roofingsites.com and sign up for a roofing marketing strategy session with, well, with me. Also, this past year, I published my book, The Ultimate Guide to Digital Marketing for Roofers. If you're a roofing company owner and you don't have this book in your hands, I will send it to you for free. Just go to go.roofingsites.com and I'll send you a free digital copy of my book. Well, roofers, join me next time and we'll connect with another great roofing entrepreneur and learn how they hack their growth. Until then, I'm Chris Hunter. Thanks and gig em.